share the heart like Jesus, by his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious, oh, how blessed to call him mine, all oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus, he is more than life to me. Blessed Lord, I see love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree, mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. All oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. Blessed Lord, I see what a wonderful redemption never can a mortal know. How my sin, though red like crimson, can be whiter than the snow. All oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the bitterness of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Every need is hand supplying. On his strength divine relying, he is all in all to me. life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand, in my blessed Lord I see, by the crystal flowing river, with the ransom I will see, and forever and forever, praise and glorify the King. My soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day, without Him I would fall. When I am sad, to Him I go, no other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, Wow. 
watches o'er me day and night, following him by day and night. glad he's my friend, aren't you? It is good to see you this morning. We'll make a couple announcements real quick. Don't forget tonight at 5 p.m. we have our Sunday night service. Okay, three of us are excited. That's great. Hey, uh, so don't forget, be here at 5 o'clock, and then afterwards we're going to have a family night out in the gym, so don't forget to bring some food if, if you like eating, and uh, you can do that between uh, after, right after service and before we get playing volleyball we're gonna have a bounce house and some things for the kids so make plans on being here tonight we had a great time last sunday night and don't want you to miss out on this one so be here for that again we're glad to have our guests with us this morning hopefully the uh, service will be a blessing to you don't forget you can give online at graysonbbc.com or you can place your tithes and offerings for our members uh, in the foyer so we're gonna ask the lord to bless the remainder of our service and we'll have a good offertory father we come before you we thank you again for your goodness. We thank you that we have the ability and the opportunity that you've given us to meet together this morning and to serve you. Lord, I pray that you just meet with us here this morning, that your Holy Spirit would have free reign in our life, uh, that you'd use the preaching of your words to speak to our hearts. There's someone here today that's unsaved, that don't know you as their personal Savior. I pray that you would speak to them and that come to know you today. Well, we do ask that you bless our missionaries around the world that are serving on a foreign field and even in the United States, as we have many church plants going on this morning. Pray that you'd give them fruit for their labor, that you would save souls, uh, that you'd encourage them. Lord, I pray that the offerings be used to meet the needs of the church and those that we support around the world. God, us now we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Well, as you may have noticed, we've changed up the service just a little bit today, and uh, we're going to do that throughout the month of October. This month is actually our missions month, and uh, we're going to be focusing in on missions and our missionaries, and then we'll have a conference, uh, missions conference at the end of the month. And so uh, I asked Brother Greg to read the scriptures and the, uh, to do a brief announcement time so that we could get up here and, and begin to talk about uh, what God's going to do, uh, and we're going to pray that God will do in our hearts through our missions month and our missions conference. Uh, it is so important, it's so vital uh, that we do not forget and lose sight uh, of our missions and our worldwide endeavor to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, that is what Grace and Bible Baptist Church is all about. 
Yes, we're here to win uh, people and to disciple people uh, in this area, and we're doing our very best to do that. But the main reason, and the main reason that God has called us to be here, a part of this church, is so that we can give our finances and our prayer and our support to the missionaries that are around the world, 137 of them that we support uh, through our World Missions Giving. And I wanted to just uh, let you know a little bit about what's going to happen this month. So we're going to move away from uh, the, the series of preaching that we've been doing on Sunday morning just for a couple weeks, uh, and we'll move away from that I May Know Him series, uh, and we're going to be preaching on missions, and, uh, which is uh, near and dear to your preacher's heart. And so uh, I know that uh, it is very vital that we uh, extend a lot of uh, uh, hospitality and a lot of love to the missionaries when they come for this conference. Now, you in your bulletin, you have an insert there, and it has the pictures of the missionaries that will be here for the conference. It has a little bit of a description of their names and their, their children's names. Let me tell you, if you will just have one or two of the families' names memorized, and when they come in, you say, hey, Mr. Crotz, it's so great to see you, or Brother Gardner, it's wonderful to see you and your wife and kids, and you can name off their names, and you know where they're going. Uh, you have no idea as a missionary what that means to somebody coming into a church where you don't know anybody, you're trying to present your ministry, uh, and then they're able to have been praying for you, and they know who you are. Uh, that is a tremendous thing, uh, just a super encouragement for the missionaries during the conference. So if you'll do that uh, as a church member, do that for me. Uh, help the missionaries when they come in to feel uh, welcomed, to feel loved, to feel appreciated. Uh, that'll be a great thing. And so our conference is going to be the last week of October. Uh, it will be October 27, 28, and 29. So it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday meetings at 7 o'clock. And then Friday, we won't have anything scheduled. Uh, and then Saturday morning, we're going to have uh, showers of blessing. Now, men, this is not a baby shower, okay? It's not a wedding engagement shower. I don't go to those things. I don't, it's, it's okay what everybody else wants to do, but I try not to go to those things. This is not that kind of shower, okay? What we're going to do with this is from 10 to 12... You're going to be able to come in and present your gifts that you've bought for the missionaries. And uh, they're going to stand around in the foyer and in the Welcome Center. And uh, what we're going to do is there's going to be cards uh, out at the mission statement station. If you saw it when you came in, uh, there's banners and there's a table there in the foyer. Uh, if you, uh, everything that we need about missions conference is going to be located there. So if you need to sign up for something, if you need a card uh, of gifts that you can buy for the missionaries, all the missionaries have filled out a wish list. And they have all these different things, ranging from, like, I saw some socks on there, all the way up to computers and different things, and paying off cars and crazy things. Uh, so any value, money value that you can uh, do, we would love for you to take one of those cards, go purchase that thing, and then bring it on the Saturday of the missions conference from 10 to 12, and present it to the missionary. And this is going to be fun. Uh, we're going to, they have, uh, some of the missionaries have, uh, small children and you're going to be able to get some of the things that they need and present it to them. Now don't everybody run out and buy the kids stuff. Okay. Uh, you have to buy some things for the adults too, but, uh, we're going to have a great time with that. I've been thinking for a long time this year about our conference and how we would do this with COVID going on. Uh, there's so many of the things that we do in a conference normally that we're not going to be able to do. And so we wanted to be a blessing. The theme of the conference is be a blessing. And so we're going to give you opportunity to be a blessing to the missionaries in a, different, a couple different ways. And so we are so excited. Uh, our staff have been working on this for a good while. Uh, we've been putting it together. There's also that week a deputation school, a training school for the missionaries that we will be involved in and have on the campus uh, that week of Missions Conference. So there's a lot of exciting things about to happen the last week of October. Uh, and as we get there, we want you to be praying about your faith promise commitment. I am so proud of you. So proud of Grace and Bible Baptist Church. We have given more this year to missions than we gave last year. Throughout COVID, throughout all the discussion of depression and economic collapse and uh, meltdowns and all the things that everybody's been scaring us to death with, we have given more by the grace of God this year than we gave last year to worldwide missions. And that is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. And all the glory goes to the Lord uh, for that. But I appreciate your faithfulness. And that just encourages me to let me know that Grace and Bible Baptist Church, through God's power, can do anything. We can do absolutely anything. And it makes me excited about what God's going to help us to do next year. 
for missions after we have our commitments. And so uh, you can find a Faith Promise commitment card out there at the mission statement station. And then next Sunday they'll be in the pews. And you can pray about that and fill out your commitment card any time that you would like. So as I said, we're going to change gears a little bit from uh, the series that we were in. And I've got a couple messages that I want to preach to get our focus on missions. Uh, you know, it's a good thing to get your focus off of yourself and to put it onto somebody else. That's always a good thing. It will make you grateful. It'll make you thankful for what you have. You know, people react differently to different things. Have you ever noticed that? Something can happen to somebody, and then it happened to somebody else, and they react completely different. Uh, it's not even close. When my wife for dinner makes broccoli, our family reacts to that differently. My kids are like, oh, yeah, broccoli. I know, they're weird. They're really weird. And my reaction is, keep that stuff away from the rest of the food. That's my reaction. I want to make sure that it doesn't even, hey, those little trees, broccoli trees, have little limbs. And they get all over the food, if you're not careful. <laughs> I react differently to that than they do. A lot of people in Texas in the middle of the summertime react differently when the weather forecaster says it's going to be 100 degrees. Some people react differently. I'm like, yes, I love heat. I love the hot. I love the hot weather. I like it so much better than winter time and snow. And then some people are like, oh, man, I was going to go outside, but now I'm not. You know, depending on where you're at in life and what you're doing and what kind of taste you have, when the weatherman says it's going to be 105, you have a different reaction between different people. One of the times when we were in Argentina, and I was a missionary there, we lived in the city of Buenos Aires, a capital city there, uh, millions and millions of people. It's kind of like New York City down in South America. And uh, they had never in the city, now up toward, out toward the mountains and in other regions of the country they had, but they had never in the city had any snow for 89 years it hadn't snowed. And one winter we were there, and it began to snow flurry, and everybody was out in the streets. They closed the schools down, closed all the businesses down. Everybody was out in the street playing around. I'm like, really? I mean, some of the people, really, seriously, some of the people that were 40, 50, 60 years old had never seen snow in person. And they were just, they were throwing it around and having the biggest party you ever saw. And I was just like, well, it didn't snow enough on the ground to do anything. So I was just like, well, okay. They're like, preacher, it's snowing. I'm like, yeah, I, I know. We reacted totally differently to that same event. And I want to look this morning at three ways that people react to the gospel. Three different ways that people react to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And our text is going to be found in Acts chapter 17, the book of Acts chapter 17. So go there with me. Acts 17, we have the missionary, the Apostle Paul, that is uh, basically what we would call, he's right in the middle of what we would call the mission field. He's out there, he's starting churches, he's preaching the gospel to people that have never heard it before. Uh, he is out there doing the work of the Lord. In Acts chapter 17, uh, he has already preached in a town called Thessalonica and had many different reactions to the gospel, that's for sure. And then he's preached at Berea, and he's had more reaction to the gospel. And some people are following and chasing him all over the place, trying to put him in jail or, or get him to stop preaching the gospel because they don't want to hear it. Some people have been saved. There's different reactions to the gospel that he's preached in this, these two towns. So we see in verse 16 of Acts 17, join me there, and I want to show you that Paul, the Apostle Paul, is going to preach a message, and he's going to get three different reactions to the gospel from this message. Look at verse 16. The Bible says, now well, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Now, as I said, he's preached at two different locations, and at Berea, the people that were trying to get him to go, uh, get him uh, arrested and trying to get him into jail or, or whatever they were trying to accomplish, they were trying to make him stop preaching. 
Those people chased him out of Berea and chased him out of Thessalonica, and basically he ran to uh, Athens uh, with Luke and some other of his party. He's there in Athens, the great city, the great Greek city. He's there waiting on Timothy and Silas and some of the other ones from his party to get everything done uh, and to come over to Athens to meet them there so they can continue on. They're on their journey to Corinth. Uh, The city of Corinth is really... Uh, pretty close to Athens. And so Paul has just got a layover is what we would call it. Uh, He's not on a flight, but he's got a layover in Athens. He's waiting on his helpers and his team to arrive. And so while he's there, as he always did, Paul, the great missionary apostle, is going to look around in the city and see what's going on. He's going to get a lay of the land. Now, at this time, Athens is not the great metropolis, it's not the great uh, culture and art and uh, uh, philosophical center of the world like it used to be some 400 years before Paul would be there uh, in our text, but it is still one of the cultural centers of the world. And uh, as Paul is walking around, I can just see him there walking through the city of Athens. And the great Parthenon, if you've ever seen that, even the ruins of it are absolutely amazing. And they'll show you diagrams of what it would have looked like. And uh, the great uh, god Athenis and, and all the things, the statues and all the columns and all the things. That was just one temple in this city of Athens that had 30,000 gods. Little g. 30,000 gods that they worshipped. Someone has said that it was easier to find a God in Athens than it was to find a man. They were temples, statues, there was all kinds of everything that you could think of about religion and false gods and idolatry and all those things were everywhere when you went to the city of Athens. And Paul saw this. He was contemplating as he was walking around and he he saw the city wholly given over, the Bible says, to idolatry. And it broke Paul's heart because he knew there was no power, there was no salvation in those false gods and in those idols. Verse 17 says, therefore, disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews. So what he does is this is his M.O., The Apostle Paul, when he gets into a town, he goes directly to the synagogue because of his background of being a Pharisee and knowing all about the Jews and their religion. uh, He would go to the synagogue and preach and teach. And so he did that. And then he also is discussing or preaching with devout persons, it says. So he's talking to the religious crowd outside of the Jewish people and in the market daily with them that met with him. So in the marketplace, he's talking to the common people. He's talking to the regular vendors and the, and the painters and the uh, construction people. He's talking to all the regular people uh, in the marketplace. So there's, you can see three different types of people right there that he's talking to and preaching the gospel to. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. Now, you need to understand what those two groups mean, who they are. The Epicureans are the atheists of the day. They, believe, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in, uh, the, that there is a deity. They don't believe in a higher power. And as a matter of fact, they believed in a very, not billions of years, but a very old earth. And they had the beginnings of Darwinism, and they had the beginnings of evolution even way back then. So he has this group of atheists that are coming to talk to him and encounter with him. And then the Stoics are the pantheists. If you know what that means, they believe that God is everything. God is this pulpit. God is the speaker. God is in the carpet. He's in the pew. uh, He's in the ceiling. He's in those lights. He's everywhere. Okay? So the atheists are just... Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. There's no reason to live. Just pleasure is all there is. Let's have as good a time as we can have, because as soon as this is over, we're out of here. And and we cease to exist. The Stoics that are pantheists are more about experiences and more about, uh, it's kind of like a new age thought. Uh, There's a lot of mysticism, a lot of spiritualism there uh, in their religion. And so you get these two groups of people, and they sound really similar to who we deal with today. There are a lot of people, I just was watching on YouTube the other day, this, this young lady, I don't, she didn't look like she was more than 20 years old to me, I can't, I'm not a very good judge anymore, 
The older I get, the worse judge I am of how old people are. But she was talking about uh, all these existential things and the fact that this is not reality that we live in. That, that, that this is just a, a dream state that we live in, and you're not really you. You're just a compilation of all these neurons that are firing and all your experiences, and basically this, this, and this. And half of what she said didn't make a, a lick of sense to me. But let me tell you, when she got down to the end of it, basically there's no reason to live. And that's where that ends up. That's where you head when you have that type of philosophy. So these two groups of philosophers came and encountered the Apostle Paul, and boy, the fireworks are about to happen. So then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, scholars looking at this story, and they're looking at the events that happened, and what happens at the end of his preaching the message, they have determined that the Stoics and the Epicureans and those that were going to listen to him up on Mars Hill basically thought he was talking about two different gods. They misunderstood what he was saying, and they thought there was the God of Jesus and the God of the resurrection. That resurrection was a God because they had gods in their 30,000 of them that were the God of truth. They were the God of lies. They were God of this, God of that. And so they thought that he was talking about two different gods, and that's why they got confused at the end. I'm not sure that that is true, but that's what some of them say. Verse 19 says, And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. So they're interested. They're curious. But let's find out why they're curious. Verse 20, For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Now that sounds like a lot like America in 2020. I did a little bit of research to get ready to preach this message. Did you know... And maybe you do, maybe you don't, how much time we spend, it's, uh, depending on what stat and the statistic you want to look at, there are, it's an inordinate amount of time that we spend with entertainment and social media and all of the different things, all the different information and data that's coming in. Why do we peruse over that over and over and over again all day long? They, they have stats of how many times you open up your phone, how many times you go to Facebook, how many times you watch this, how many times you watch TikTok, whatever you're watching. All these things that have all these stats about it, and it's absolutely amazing that we are so enamored with information. Why? So we can go tell everybody. Hey, I saw this. I saw that. Did you see that? No, I didn't see that. Did you see that? No, I didn't see that. Did you see this? And we're just like the Athenian people. We can't wait to get to church or to work or wherever so that we can tell somebody something new. Did you know that we are in the age, I'm sure you do if you think about it for a second, we're in the information overload age. The average person, not a, not a millennial or a teenager, the average person in America, has 34 gigabytes of information a day. Now, for some of you that don't know what a gigabyte is, that means nothing to you. But let me tell you, that is a lot of information that's going through our head. And no wonder by the time you get done at work and you go home and your wife says, Hey, honey, what do you want for dinner? You go, That is a lot of information. So we are very similar. We find ourselves in a very similar place. We have the atheists that believe what the Epicureans believe. We have the Stoics all around us that believe what the Stoics believe. We have the information overload. We can't wait to go tell each other new things and new doctrines and new beliefs and new facts that we've found. Verse 22, notice what Paul did. You know what the Apostle Paul did, didn't do? He didn't give them more information. He didn't put out a whole bunch of movies and videos. Uh, he just he preached. I think that's what we ought to do today, too. I'm not opposed to all those other things. 
But I think we ought to focus in on the preaching of the Word of God. Verse 22 says, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Uh, yeah. They got 30,000 gods just in the town. And so Paul says, I've looked around all over the town, and it looks like you guys are really, really religious people. He says, verse 23, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, that's the altars that they had built, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now, here's what happened according to the scholars and historians that know what happened in Athens. Apparently, there was a plague years before Paul is there that came through the town. And to abolish and get rid of the plague, they sent a flock of sheep through the town. And wherever the sheep stopped, they sacrificed them right there. And so when they sacrificed them right next to a god or to a deity or an altar that they had, then they knew that that sheep stopped right there to appease that god. But there were some of them that stopped in places where there was no altar or no God being worshipped. And so they put up an altar right there to the unknown God that must have asked the sheep to stop there so that it could be sacrificed. Now, I'm not kidding. That's what happened. And so Paul is running around the town and looking and sightseeing and sees all of these unknown God altars. And he says, hey, I'm going to show you. I'm going to tell you who that unknown God is. And you know what I've noticed as I've been studying this text and this message? Number one, this is the best gospel message I've ever heard in my life outside of the messages that Jesus Christ himself preached. This is an absolutely fantastic, amazing message of the gospel. We're going to see that in just a minute. The other thing that I've noticed is when Paul is dealing with the Stoics and the Epicureans, the atheists and the pantheists and the, the New Age movement and the different people, you know, all these things that we're experiencing, these other religions right now that we're experiencing in 2020, they're not new. They've been around for thousands of years. They just put a new package on it, put a new name on it, and they keep believing the same thing. Now, let me tell you, what he doesn't do when he begins to preach this message on Mars Hill in front of the council of the Areopagus, in front of the council of all the philosophers and the intellectuals of that day in the city of Athens, which were above all other intellectuals at that time, what he doesn't do is go, you know what, let's debate about this or that or the, the cultural events and things that are going on. He begins at God. And I think when you're trying to give the gospel to somebody, that's the place to start. It don't talk about how bad our society is. And when you're trying to witness to somebody, you're trying to preach the gospel, start at God. And once they get a good idea of who God is, then the, all the rest of it's going to fall in place. Well, notice what Paul says in the beginning of his message. This is one of the best introductions that I've ever heard. He said, I'm going to preach to you the unknown God that you're already, already worshiping. But he declares who that God is. I think that's another problem we have sometimes. We don't tell people what God we're talking about. He says, I'm going to talk to you, verse 24, about the God that made the world and all things therein. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, well if not in temples made with hands. He's not in this Parthenon. This beautiful temple you got over here, this God I'm talking about to you, he doesn't dwell there in that temple. He is not part of, uh, of ancient philosophy. He's not part of some story. He doesn't dwell, he's not made and represented by idols and statues that man can make. He is God Almighty. That's who I'm going to preach to you about. I think we need to declare very very clearly what God we're talking about. If we want people to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God the Father's Son, He's the Son of God, He is the God-man, if we want people to accept Him, they need to know what God we're talking about. We're talking about God Jehovah of the Bible, the creator of the universe. Now, He's going to walk right down through and dispute every thought and every inclination of evolution or any old earth theories that they may have, or the fact that the atheists don't believe that there's a supreme creator or being, watch what he does. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Now what's amazing about mankind is that man wants to think that they can make God. 
And the truth of the fact is that God made man. See, man wants to fashion God into their appearance and their likeness and what they want. And the truth of the matter is, is that it's so arrogant for man to think that they can make God. God made man. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now, don't miss that little phrase. Our God, made out of one race, one man, one woman, he made all the human race. They're not races, and science has finally caught up to what Paul was preaching 2,000 years ago. If you look at the, the, the genetic codes, if you look at DNA, if you look at all the things, we all came from the same race. We have all the same great, 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 great. Grandparents. What is that doing? It's demolishing and, and it's, it's going against, it's debating and going against their evolutionary thoughts. If there's no races, if there's, not one, if there's only one race that we all came from, let me tell you, there's no division of the species, there's no evolutionary process because we all came from the same place. hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God has set up men. He's set up kings. He's taken down kings. He's set up governments. He's taken down governments. He said this empire is going to go till here. This empire is going to rise here. These people are going to live here. Those people are going to live there. This is what's going to happen. God is in control of all the earth. That they, now why is God set up the kingdoms and set up all the empires and set up this world and why did he create mankind paul's going to tell us in his wonderful message here he says verse 27 god did all that that they whose they that's mankind that they should seek the lord if happily they might feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us if you reach out to know more about god god will reach back God wants you to find him. God wants you to search after him. God wants you to worship him. Verse 28, for in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of our own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, now don't miss that. What is atheist and atheism and evolution and all of this pantheism and all of this spiritualism and, and all of these different religions that are based on those things. What do they tell mankind? You are basically a blob that came from another blob and one of these days you're going to die and that's the end of it. It takes all importance and all possibilities and all hope out of mankind and makes it to where we are worthless. According to the evolutionary theory, we are no better, just a very, very click better, small little step better than the animals, and we're all going to end up in the same place. Well, my Bible says that God created man in his image. We are prominent, we are important. We're not to be prideful about it, but God has made us in his image. There's something of the image of God that's in every human being. That makes us important, so important, in fact, that God would send his only begotten son to die on the cross to save mankind from their sins. If that doesn't make us important in the vision and the eyes and the heart of God, I don't know what does. I feel really bad, and I feel really discouraged sometimes to watch our young generation that's being raised up under these theories and these philosophies and they have no desire to even live what's the point now the point is because you were made in the image of god and god has created you and he's worked out all of redemption's plan throughout history so that he could save you from your sins and spend eternity with you that's the point because he loves us so much for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that God, that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, I have 
really had an issue with that verse right there. Number one, in the original language, the translators translated it winked at, which doesn't have the same connotation today in our English as it did back then. The word just means that he overlooked, he had patience with. But now you read through that and you think, okay, all through the Old Testament and all the way till Paul's preaching in this message, every time somebody sinned and every time somebody was idolatrous and they trusted in other false gods, God's up there going, it's okay. That's not the case, okay? That's not what this scripture is meaning or saying. There's a connotation thing here going on. God has waited. He has patiently waited for man's day in court. Let me show you what this verse means. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, and I want you to really focus in for just a second because I want to I want to explain this to you uh, in, in, in very clear terms what this verse is talking about. It says, verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, now what is the law? The law is the Ten Commandments and everything that Moses got from God on the mountain. So it's, it's the law of God. It's God's law, the Ten Commandments, most of, would be the main part of it. It saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Now, why did God give the Israelites through Moses the law? Why did he give them the Ten Commandments? Because when I look at the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, I look at that and I say, I can't do that. I can't keep it. I break the law. I break the Ten Commandments all the time. And no matter how hard I try to be good, I can't keep it the Ten Commandments, and neither can you. So, God gave us the Ten Commandments and the law so that every mouth would be stopped and everyone would understand that they are a sinner and they cannot be perfect. Verse 20. Therefore, because of that, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You cannot get to heaven. Justified means that your sins and your sin debt, the payment of it, has been taken care of, paid in full. You cannot get justified for your sins by keeping the law because no one can keep it. But now, verse 21 says, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. So how do we get justified, get the payment in full of our sins and forgiveness of our sins and eternal life? We get it through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. Verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one is going to make it to heaven on their own. You can't do it. People have been trying for thousands of years, and unless you lived a perfect, sinless life from the moment you were born until the moment you died, you can't get there. Being justified freely, you're not working for it, for by grace are you saved, Ephesians says, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission or the taking away, the cleansing of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. There it is. There's where he winked at it. See, what happened is when you were born, you started sinning. Bam. Sin, 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 sin. Some of us, hundreds a day. All those sins are mounting up. You need somebody to take care of them. Somebody to get them forgiven in the sight of God so that you can go into heaven, perfect holy place where God lives. So God overlooked or was patiently waiting throughout all those sins until the day you were going to be saved. And he justified you. He paid the price for your sins on that moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that's what that verse in Acts is talking about in this wonderful gospel message. God was waiting on your court date. 
You know, there's, there's families that have, unfortunately, accidents, and somebody, maybe a drunk driver plows into them, and their children die in the accident. The drunk driver has a court date for a year and a half from now sometimes. So what is the family doing? Are they, have they forgiven the guy? No. Are they looking the other way? No. Are they winking at him? No. They're waiting on his day in court to get justice. And that's exactly what God has done with us. He's waiting, waiting, waiting patiently until you come to Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And he's going to forbear or forgive all those sins. But the Gospel of John chapter 3 says that if you don't believe on the name of the Son of God, you're condemned already. And so for people that don't get saved, all those past, present, and future sins, God's just accumulating them up. He's just writing them down. And one of these days at the great white throne judgment, your court date will be on that day. You will stand before an almighty holy God, and you will have to give an account and pay the price for your sins yourself. So that's what it means in this message when he says that God winked at. But now he's asking everyone to repent. What does that mean? Now, when you hear the gospel, when you hear the gospel message, God wants you to repent of those sins and ask his son to be your savior. Verse 31 says, Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. You want to know if Jesus is worthy to be the judge of all the world on the court day? He is because he rose from the dead no one else has. Now don't miss this. The resurrection is the primary point of the gospel. I will repeat that again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the primary point of the gospel. It's what tells us and gives us the proof positive that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. That he can say and that he wasn't just an average guy dying on the cross like thousands of others have. That he wasn't just this or that or the other, just a good teacher. That he is the son of God is proven by the resurrection. And I've heard people preach the gospel, and I've heard people talk to other people in private and in one-on-one conversations and try to get them to hear the gospel and accept Christ as their personal Savior, and they don't even mention the resurrection. The Bible says very clearly in Romans 10 that you have to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So Paul says, The reason that Jesus is going to be worthy and he is the one that's going to judge all mankind because he raised himself from the dead. No one else has. Now, one of the things that makes this one of the greatest gospel messages ever is everything that we've talked about, but also the fact that it probably only took about 10 minutes to preach. Okay. I thought y'all would like that. And when they, who is they, the Epicureans, the atheists, the Stoics, the Pantheists, these people that we've described, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Now that's the first reaction to the gospel. Some people will make fun of it. Some people will chide and deride and and, and talk and make fun of and and just make all kinds of jokes and say, oh, you're unlearned, you're you're ignorant of the facts, you don't believe in science, this and that and the other, and they're going to mock and they're going to make fun of. That's the first reaction to the gospel. And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. Now there's a start. Some people say, you know what, that's, that's pretty interesting. I like that. I'm going to start thinking about that. I'm going to come back to church next Sunday. And some people began to mull it over. They began to think about it. They began to study it. They began to be inquisitive about it. But notice the third reaction to the gospel. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, that's to Paul, and believed. Among the which was Dionysius, the Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Now one of the guys that was on the council got saved. And there was a lady there that was in in the court or in the hearing of Paul when he preached, and she got saved. And others with them. 
Now, Paul doesn't tell us how many got saved that day, but there was a few people that accepted the gospel and got saved and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the way it will always be when you preach the gospel. You're going to have some people make fun of it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to listen. They don't want to have anything to do with it. They think we're crazy for being here Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And then you're going to have some that are going to say, you know what? I think I'm going to investigate this thing. I'm going to come back next week and see what happens. And then you have some that accept the Lord as their personal Savior. And they get saved. The Bible says in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but to unto us that are saved. It is the power of God. Let me tell you, there's three different reactions to the gospel. And now, right now, as we speak, and all day today, there's 137 different ministries around the world that are preaching the gospel. They're called missionaries that we support out of our church that are on our missionary team. We give them monthly support, prayer support, and other kinds of support. And let me tell you, they're going to get three reactions from the gospel. They're going to have people that make fun of it. They're going to have people that want to know more. And they're going to have people that accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And that's why coronavirus or no coronavirus, economic crash or no economic crash, whatever happens in the White House with the election, whatever happens next year, whatever chaos and cat catastrophe that happens in 2021, we have no idea what will or won't happen. But the truth of the matter is, Grace and Bible Baptist Church, we've got to stand firm in what God has called us to do and preach the gospel around the world so that all three reactions to the gospel can happen. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We're going to keep on doing what God has told us to do. And I want you to be faithful this next year in your commitments to faith promise missions so that the message can be preached because there's some of them out there that are going to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And if that missionary hadn't have been there to preach the gospel, and if we hadn't have sent him, that person would never have heard the gospel in a clear form and been able to be saved that way. What a tremendous responsibility we have to get the gospel out. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful message, this great example of preaching the gospel that we have recorded in the scriptures from the Apostle Paul. What a tremendous preacher he must have been. God, we can learn so much from his approach and from the way that he did things. But, Lord, the truth of the matter is, is we can stand around talking about things all day long. But the real truth of the matter is, is time is running short and we need to get the job done. We need to get out into the new neighborhoods here in Sherman, Texas that are being built all around us. Invite people to church so they can hear the gospel. We need to get out into the state of Texas and start churches and plant new churches all over so that pe people can hear the gospel. And, Lord, we need to keep funding and supporting and praying for our missionaries so that they can go around the world and preach the gospel. Would you help us, Lord, to remain focused on what you've called us to do? Well, thank you for it. God, I pray that if there's one here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, they've reacted already with mockery and making fun of the gospel. Maybe they've become inquisitive and they've come back many, many times to hear the gospel, but they still haven't accepted they still haven't been saved. Would you help them to do that today? Make this their day of salvation. Lord, I thank you for everything that you're going to do and what you've done today already in our worship service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Don sings a verse of invitation. If God has spoken to your heart, maybe you want to start, get an early start praying for your faith promise commitment, praying for what you can do, how you can be a blessing, whatever the case may be. If you need to do something with the Lord, the altars are open. We have counselors here to help you. Anything that you can do. Uh, we want you to do in this moment as we sing.